Welcome to the Nemeth Report podcast. I'm Dr. Tammy Nemeth, energy historian, analyst, and consultant, and I'll be your host. Most Canadians don't know or understand very much about the energy situation in Quebec. If asked, many would probably remark on Quebec's incredible hydroelectric power. Some know that Quebec exports a great deal of electricity to nearby provinces and the United States. Indeed, the government of Quebec's green economy plan states it will continue and maybe even increase those exports to become the battery of Northeastern America. Some, however, have started to question whether that is possible. Recently, David Bodeville wrote a piece asking the question, could Quebec run out of energy? Today, I'm pleased to welcome David on the podcast to discuss Quebec's energy situation. Hi, David, welcome to the program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm wondering if you could maybe introduce yourself to our listeners and how did you come to this issue? Yes, so I came to this issue. Um, I basically worked uh, for about 10 years in politics be be before moving onto more of a lobbying government affairs side. And from 2014 until 2017, I was uh, general director of the Quebec Oil and Gas Association. Since then, always been, of course, in very interested in all the uh, issues about energy, whether it's production, transport, you know, pipelines. You know, ca Canada has witnessed quite a few uh, interesting discussions, if not battles, about uh, infra about oil and gas infrastructure and energy infrastructure in general. So I've always been very interested in this, and I've launched my own uh, government affair firm in uh, November 2020. And you know we have we have a few clients in the fields of energy, so I've I've always kept well informed about the topic, and uh, it's moving in Quebec. There's a lot of things that are happening. So uh, you know, pu published an article in our newsletter last month, and uh, here we are doing an interesting podcast about you know the Quebec angle to this all uh, North American and Canadian uh, energy distribution issues. Excellent. Um, so. Can you explain um, how have the Quebec energy issues evolved over time to the point that Quebec is a major exporter of electricity to the United States and neighboring provinces? Yeah, so I would say the, the starting point, not to go that far back, is in the mid-1940s after the Second World War, Canada in general wanted to become more uh, you know, independent of its own energy, uh, especially, you know, after the war, the United States was getting very big. Uh, you know, the ties from Canada with Europe were uh, a little bit more difficult because these countries were in re reconstruction. So you start to have in Quebec people saying that maybe we should maybe we should nationalize the electric company. Maybe we should build, you know, our own energetic powerhouse to uh, to be able not not to be dependent on, on the rest of the country, the U.S. or anywhere in the world. So this idea basically came into fruition in the mid-1960s under the Quebec Liberal government that decided to nationalize uh, all, the, all the small electric power companies. And basically what they did, contrary to some other countries did, is that not only did they create a monopoly of production of electricity, but also, and even more importantly, of distribution of electricity. And then, since it was a state monopoly, the revenues, you know, <clears throat> were going straight into uh, the Quebec government coffers. And then they said, "Well, this is interesting. Why not? Why not crank up production uh, and be able to, yes, serve our population in Quebec and give low rates both to residential and industrial customers, but also why not produce more, export to the U.S. and to other provinces, and and make it a source of revenue to help the province." So this is basically where it stemmed from. And you know, at the time, Quebec was not saying let's be the battery of North America, but they were saying let's make sure that first we're independent and also that that we can make it uh, we can make good trade in energy. That's a really good point. I, I know that ties into the, the 60s with the quiet revolution and the growing sort of uh, uh, Quebec nationalism and, and the sense that you couldn't really be your own state if you didn't have your own means of energy. And so I, that, I think, was a quite a motivating factor that, mm -hmm. that you've, you've mentioned there. So when you have the expansion of, say, the James Bay project, which mm -hmm. took place in the 70s, and there there was this excess electricity for export, um, what about oil and gas and the use of that 
in Quebec. Um, there's there's the various refineries, but they don't necessarily produce oil and gas um, independently. So can you comment a little bit about the that, that sort of energy mix and the role of oil and gas in Quebec? That's a good point. And there's a link to the history in Quebec. So, so when Quebec had its first very early uh, I wouldn't call it the discovery of natural gas, but but mainly, you know, they knew that there was natural gas in Quebec. They said, well, we're going to do the same as we did with, with Hydro. Let's have SOQIP, S-O-Q-U-I-P, which is going to be a state monopoly of natural gas. But of course, you know, the, the hydro electricity lobbying was so strong. They were making so much money with this that they decided to let the wells go. Okay, if someone in the private sector wants to buy the wells, want to claim the land and want to start producing, well, they can do it, but it's not going to be done under a state monopoly. And what happened was in Quebec is that, especially in the mid part of the 2000s, like 2005, 2006, you had a significant natural gas recovery, discovery in the, in the lowlands, uh, like, like, you know, south shore of the, of the St. Lawrence River. And at the same time, some people were digging for, for oil in Gaspésie, and they were able to find some. Unfortunately, so far, uh, it's not been developed uh, at all let alone develop to the full extent. So Quebec has continued to rely very heavily on hydroelectricity. Though when you look at consumption in Quebec, it's basically 50-50. If you look at the, the, the number of petajoules or gigawatts, whatever measure you want to call, use, it's basically even between, between electricity and oil and gas. So, so, so in that regard, yes, Quebec is a powerhouse of hydro, but relies 100% from outside sources for um, um, oil, gasoline, various products, and, nat and, and natural gas. And in terms of refining, Quebec used to be a real powerhouse of refining with five full-scale operating refineries. Only two are left, one in eastern Montreal, one of the south shore of Quebec City. And today, Quebec refines about its daily consumption in terms of oil. Uh, and the problem they had is that the refineries cannot take oil sands at all, can only take light crude. So, so it, it, mainly comes, it mainly comes from the U.S., some from Western Canada through Sarnia and Ontario. Right. And what about the natural gas? I, I understand that um, the natural gas flowing into Quebec comes mainly from the Enbridge hub in Ontario, but I thought that took a mix of natural gas from Western Canada as well as from the United States. So um, <laughs> which, which natural gas that ends up in Quebec? Well, that's a good question, question because you're right. When the natural gas is put into a hub or, or a reserve, whether it's at, at, whether it's, it, it's at dawn or, or elsewhere, once the gas is in, it's impossible for you to know <laughs> where the molecule was coming from when the gas goes out. So actually, Quebec gets most of its gas from, from there, uh, of course, through uh, gas pipelines into Quebec. But it's almost impossible even for the, even for the energy distributor to know exactly how much is U.S. gas and how much is Canadian gas. Honestly, your guess is your guess is as good as mine because uh, basically all they do is they buy the gas, they transport it, and they sell the gas. So even even then, they don't really need to know honestly where it comes from. Uh, there are quite a few projects in Quebec to bring more direct connections between Western Canada through Northern Ontario onto Quebec for natural gas. But unfortunately, so far these projects have not these projects have not materialized. Uh, my educated guess is that probably more and more. Uh, in terms of the volume of gas that we use in Quebec, more and more comes from the U.S. as time goes by, uh, mainly because U.S. gas is a bit cheaper. So that's probably that's probably what the buyer is looking first and foremost at dawn or or in, in other hubs. But uh, but 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 that's an educated guess. That's not something that I know for a fact. Right. Um... So in terms of the energy mix in Quebec, you mentioned that it's 50-50. Um, the 50% electricity is used for, I think there's a certain percentage that is used for heating. So the other 50%, yes. the oil and gas, what, um, what is that primarily used for? Is it industry and automobiles, like transportation and heating? Yeah, so 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 so, so to, be, to, to be crystal clear, it's not really 50-50. It's the same amount of oil and gas compared to, to electricity, but you still have, you know, wind, solar, biomass, and other things. So I would say they're equal, okay. but they're not, they're not really 50-50. But you're right that 
Quebec, you know, so oftentimes in energy circles, you say, let's use the right energy at the right place. So definitely in Quebec, there, there's some electricity that is used for ethane that might be better served by natural gas or other sources. Uh, but I would say definitely to your point, most of the most of the oil, especially that is used, is definitely into transportation. So that can be cars, that can be trucks, but also uh, uh, agricultural machinery uh, that is, that is quite high in volume. Most of the natural gas would be used for eating, uh, whether it's uh, buildings, industries, or in uh, in residence in in residence. But you know, most of the, most of Quebec is now out of oil and diesel for eating individual and personal homes, except on the Magdalen Islands. Uh, it, it's been replaced. There's a lot of eating that's been replaced by hydroelectricity now, which is one of the things that puts a lot of pressure on the grid. Right. So um, that brings us kind of to the the green energy economic plan or the green economic plan and the, and the energy transition. And <laughs> so if... If the goal then is to electrify everything and take the cars off the road and have EVs instead, electric vehicles, and to replace all heating to electrical and still maintain the exports, um, how is that? Do you think that's possible? Is that feasible given the current infrastructure and are there, are there plans to, to expand that infrastructure? Well, mathematically, something's got to give, okay, because... You cannot, you cannot have a plateau of hydroelectricity production like we have in Quebec, and at the same time, increasing population, increase in industrial power, and a lot of industrial and commercial projects that want a set of, one set of foot in Quebec. So at the same time, what the plan says is, let's use more electricity for transportation like electric cars electric trucks even at the industrial level that you know you're going to you're going to put more hydroelectricity and electricity into what you want to do and at the same time not increase production and wanting to have increased production in new industries that are going to set foot in Quebec the mathematics doesn't work so th there's only three things that you can do to solve the problem either either you increase production a lot Okay, which demands time because you need to build new dams that takes eight to, to 15 years. Or you use a, a kind of an intermediate or transitional form of energy, which could be natural gas or imports of other hydroelectricity or other things. Or you develop a mix. So you get some, you, you get some wind and solar, you use the biomass, you use a bit of natural gas. And at the same time, you try to reduce consumption and at the same time to increase eventually your production of hydroelectricity. But the thing is, everybody in Quebec, I wouldn't say everybody, but most people in Quebec thought that, you know, they just flick the switch and the light, the light goes up. Of course, we're hydropower. We have more than enough. We export to the U.S. We have more than enough for us in our development. The, things that, the thing that happens now is that Quebec is waking up to the fact that there might be some electricity shortages, which is something that not a lot of people have discussed over the last few years. And at the same time, as you have the war in Ukraine and different other geopolitical events that everybody discusses energy around the world, Quebec thought that it could escape this debate, but uh, the, the, the debate goes faster than the provinces. So, so there will be choices that need to be made. Well, with respect to those choices, um, how strong is the environmental movement in Quebec and, and its support for the green energy transition or the economic transition? How much support is there uh, for, for these environmental initiatives? There's definitely a lot of support. And I would say the four elected parties at the National Assembly, you know, on, on different levels and, and with different intensities, uh, you know, are in favor of this transition and, and, and the use of more hydro. The problem is that in the real world, now you have you have a, you have government that's saying there might be some shortages in 2025. So in terms of environmental groups, a lot of them have very serious propositions, but the 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 the, the problem that they have moving forward in this debate is that they're a little bit caught between a rock and a hard place. They've been promoting switching from oil and gas and nuclear to some extent, even though Quebec was never a big producer. So to switch for, from those sources of energy to electrifying everything, 
But now the problem with the transition is that there's not going to be enough power and there's not going to be enough electricity to achieve this. So it's going to be interesting, I think, in the next few months, but probably years, because energy debates take a long time, to see how they're going to change their 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 discourse and their public stance. Uh, and the problem that they have is that they made a lot of inroads in Quebec because they were very reasonable. They came with, with sensible solutions, work with government, work with industry. Now, if you want to go the other way, the way I would call, you know, very politely, the, the anti-growth or the degrowth zealots that say, well, the solution is just to use much less energy. Uh, you know, let's not welcome new businesses. Let's not welcome new industries. Let's close mines and other businesses. That's going to make their position a little bit more difficult. So I think that as a movement, uh, they have some decision to make as to, you know, where they want to go and where do they stand in the energy debate and what kind of compromise they, they need to make. Like, like, like everybody in the debate needs to make a compromise, especially as from a problem, this could very well move into a crisis. Right. And, and it's, I think it's the type of crisis and um, reckoning um, that it's the same across the country because if the if the Liberal government in Ottawa is serious about phasing out oil and gas, which would mean out west, there's, I mean, Saskatchewan and Alberta really don't have a lot of capability to do hydro. There's, there's limited prospects there. Um, and the wind and solar is not reliable. So then that puts, you know, the grids in out west in jeopardy. And so we're kind of facing the same situation mm -hmm. as Quebecers where we... People have taken for granted the idea that you just flip a switch and the, the lights come on, you use your stove and your, your washing machine when you want to, and now they're talking about, no, we need to control when people use things and so on. Um, yes. So that brings me to, the, to an interesting question because the Lego government surprisingly decided to ban all oil and gas development in Quebec, even though there had been, as you mentioned, these these resources found and private companies had made investments in doing proposals and there was the, the full net zero natural gas proposal. And Legault uh, uh, had mentioned in his book before he was first elected how he supported this type of initiative. And then all of a sudden it was like this switch. and. Now they they decided to ban it. So, um, how much domestic support has there been for that ban, uh, and why has there been that particular level of support? So, so the the ban was proposed uh, in, in April of, of last year, and and honestly, it passed pretty quickly through the National Assembly. Uh, there's not been a lot of polling on the on this issue. Mainly, a lot of Quebecers, you know reassured or falsely reassured that hydro's go, hydro electricity is always going to be there. We don't need other kind of resource. You know, basically already considered a fait accompli that oil and gas wouldn't be produced in Quebec, though uh, there's been some significant discoveries that at least would require pilot projects and, and, and the capacity to, to show how they could be made into commercial operations uh, and also use, using the latest technology as Carbon, carbon storage and, and, and various others producing hydro, gray or blue hydrogen, uh, that would be possibilities. So, so basically, I would say the, this bill passed a little bit too quickly for people to really be able to have a debate. I would tell you that if the ban was proposed this year with the situation of the energy, that would be a completely different situation. Uh, we need to understand also that, and it is my understanding, it's not you know a legal legal consideration, but there are some provision in the bill where where the minister himself could, uh, you know, change some part of the bill or at least in the regulations to allow for pilot projects or to allow for some changes. Not mm -hmm. saying it's going to happen overnight, but, uh, you know, definitely Quebec should, should probably not close the door too fast because this could be, uh, this could be a way to help. Also understanding that this could be a transition while you know, massive hydroelectricity production dams are built uh, because that's going to, and, and, and the new dams will bring their own environmental challenges and issues. Uh, you already have some First Nations that are coming out again, this, some, some, uh, some people in the remote regions in Quebec that say, well, you're not going to touch my river. So uh, the government of Quebec as, as, as a situation here, I wouldn't say a problem, but a situation having to deal with those various issues and, 
not having to look to a lot of different solutions. That's a really good point about the difficulties for new hydro projects. Um, I read an article, I think it was from last year, actually, that said Quebec has finished its last big hydro mega project, which is La Romaine. And the goal now is to add to electricity availability with wind and solar. Um, do you think that's the case, that, that those future hydro projects are kind of done? And can wind and solar actually fulfill the future needs of Quebecers? So three points to what you say. First, your, your assertion is right, as this is what was the official position of Hydro-Quebec, the state production and distribution monopoly. La Romaine is going to be our, our last big project. Then we're going to go with wind and solar. Uh, first, the problem is that they underestimated the growth in domestic demand, whether from you know, regular residential consumers or industrial projects that want to expand or want to establish themselves in Quebec. So, so that's, that's the first mistake they made. And the second thing that they did is that they started going left and right, but especially south, trying to negotiate massive electricity deals, export deals with the United States. So hmm. there was there was a referendum in Maine that stopped a project from going to Massachusetts, but in, New, in, in with the state of New York, they were able to they were able to close a significant deal. I think it's two hundred million dollars in terms of export. This also adds pressure on the grid. So as much as I go back, would want the Ramen to be to be the last project. When they see the, the data about the, 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 the number of megawatts that new industrial project will need, they say, well, but this, this would require the equivalent of 13, one, three projects like La Romaine. <laughs> so something has got to give at some place. And we all know that though I grew Quebec as the official position that they don't want to do new any big major dams. First, they're going to have to respond to political pressure and to political realities of the requirement of Quebec to have more power. And second, there's a lot of projects that they have in the cards that they could put forward and that they could work over the next five to 15 years. So, so there's the official position, but you know, technically if they want, if they want to have new dams, they're, there, there's, you know, the, the geology is there and the hydrology is there for Quebec to increase its power. But again, that's going to take at least 10 to 15 years to get to the market. Right. And is it mainly because of the sort of regulatory hurdles and the environmental impact assessments that need to be done? This is, this is an element, but I wouldn't underestimate either the sheer size and requirement of constructing such dams, uh, which are, you know, you know, even by 2023 standards, major endeavors, uh, you know, mega, mega projects, you know, they're remote, you need to cut wood, you need to bring people, you need to, when they built uh, La Grande in the Bay James project and in the 70s, 80s and La Romaine over the last 15 years, you literally created villages out of the workers that were there. So, so it's it's from from a human perspective and a construction perspective, it is massive. Not counting the point that you mentioned, just to get the approval and the local social license to be able to do that. So, is is Quebec entertaining the idea at all of uh, of nuclear and the small modular reactors, like the arrangement that Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Ontario have? have kind of come to an agreement with? Are they entertaining that idea at all to pursue nuclear in any way? Not that I know of. You know, the interesting point you made before that, you know, Quebec as hydro, Western Canada as, as oil and gas, the, the, response of Ford, the, the response of Ford in Ontario in Ontario over the last six to 12 months has been, well, if we want to go with clean energy, why why not expand our nuclear power in Ontario, which which you know, makes sense because they already have a strong base. Quebec never had the, 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 you know, they basically always use nuclear reactors in, basically they had two in Gentilly, just close to, to Trois-Rivières. Uh, they basically always use them more for educational and research perspective rather than, you know, wanting to expand into a nuclear energy production that would be significant in the province. And those two those two plants have not only been mudballed, but they've been completely dismantled over the last, I would say 10, 15 years. So I, I don't expect Quebec will go on, on, on the nuclear end because it would require a complete shift uh, from what they're actually doing and planning and doing. Not to say it's impossible, but but definitely I wouldn't I wouldn't bet the farm on this. 
so do you what role do you think um Quebec's 2030 plan for a green economy is will play in the the troubles that you foresee well if on, if only because you know basically this plan has as you know two on two or three underpinnings the first underpinning is Quebecers are going to reduce consumption which mm. With a lot of people, first, electricity cheap. Second, it's kind of the social contract that, okay, you, the state, you manage electricity production and distribution, but we let you do it and we're ready not to go into a competition mode because you give us lower rates. So now when the government starts to say, well, you need to reduce the heater, you need to use your, mic your, your dishwasher only at night, people really don't like that. And Quebec per capita is increasing its consumption of energy over the last 15 years if not at the same rate, faster than other provinces in Canada. So that underpinning of reduced personal consumption is going to be hard. But even if you were to reduce personal consumption and industrial consumption by 10%, if at the same time you're bringing, you're bringing 20, 30% more people over the next 10, 15 years, and you increase industrial production, maybe you reduce the intensity, but overall your use of electricity goes higher because you just have more people using it and using it for, for other purposes. So this is this is the second thing that that creates a jam, and the third thing is that you want to take some actual processes that use other forms of energy, oil, gas, biomass, whatever, and you want to switch them to electricity, which is creating kind of a triple increasing demand on the grid. And unless you have more pr production or or you ac accept that the prices go way higher, uh, you're going to be in a situation that's going to be very difficult. Uh, both economically, but also politically in Quebec for 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 whoever is in place at government. Right. I mean, because this does affect affect standard of living. And the the mm. interesting thing is that the the concept about reducing consumption that's one of the pillars of the European Union's green uh, green deal. It's one of the pillars for Justin Trudeau's green plan, which isn't really articulated very loudly. Um, and, and then I, I think if, if Quebecers have been used to low and reasonably priced electricity, and then suddenly in order to reduce consumption, Hydro-Quebec, which is, as you point out, uh, a state entity, starts jacking up the price, mm -hmm. citizens aren't going to be very happy about that. It'd be like, oh, well, wait a second, you're, you're our company. Why are we paying so much, right? No, exactly. And, and two... To continue a little bit more on your point, you know, Quebec, both on the personal level, but also for businesses and industries, you know, Quebec never had the most favorable tax system in Canada. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you compare to the North, Northeast US, it's, you know, Quebec, it's even worse. Uh, Quebec has not always been the best place where you can get massive amount of labor and at reasonable price. Ontario, British Columbia and Canada have always been better for that. You know, Michigan and New York State have also always been better for that. But Quebec has always said, well, but wait a second, our energy prices allow us to balance this to balance this out a little bit. Yes, you, yes, as a business, you pay a little bit more taxes. Yes, you pay your labor a little bit more because it's harder to get some qualified workers. But we'll make sure your energy prices are competitive, so you can be sure that you can open your plant for few, and operate it for 20, 25 years in Quebec. Now, if you start to jack up the electricity price, then 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 you change the landscape and you change the the the, the equation that people need to solve when they decide where they're going to install their uh, their 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 plants and their industrial processes. And you do a little bit the same at the personal level. The personal level, I would say, the consequences are more the consequences are more political. That people start to say. Okay, we pay a little bit more taxes, we pay a little bit more, you know, in terms of sales tax and income tax, but electricity and energy is not that expensive for us. If it starts to be the equivalent of what it is in Ontario, or, or, or even if it only bridges a gap, a gap of 50% towards what it is in Ontario, a lot of Quebec families are going to start to have trouble making en ends meet, especially in a period of inflation like the one we, we live through right now. For sure. And so... When, when the government of Quebec is planning on lowering consumption, how do they plan on doing that besides just increasing the price, which they know that people will resist? 
So what what's the, the government's plan to reduce consumption? The, the government plan, I, I think they want to put in place some incentives to reduce your consumption. Like, for example, they would say you know, uh, you know, prices can get higher or there's certain period of the day where the prices could be higher, you know, whether it's in the morning or in the late afternoon where most people use electricity, do a little bit like a modulation of prices uh, depending on, on, on supply and demand at, at that time, uh, which is something that could make sense. And they also want to use, uh, they, they, they want to use the carrot and the stick, like they want to make prices higher when the electricity demand is higher and lower when electricity demand is lower. So, so they want to try to have the carrot and the stick at the same time in terms of incentives. But in the end, if they really want to do something that is stringent in terms of massively reducing the usage of electricity, the people have so many habits. The only thing they could do is to increase the prices, which I don't think it is something politically that they would be willing to do. So that compounds to the problem that, that Hydro-Quebec needs to solve. Right. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of go back a little bit, and I'm so glad you pointed this out. It's it's the sort of contradictions involved in in a lot of these policies, because on the one hand, I hear a lot about how we need to increase immigration into Canada, that we're we're short of labor, we're going to, you know, the falling birth rate. We need to increase the population of Canada to the point mm -hmm. where it's significantly higher than what it is now. Um, and then on the, and they, the other hand, it is we need to reduce our energy use. And we had, there's a certain carbon budget, and this is what Canada is allotted regardless of how many people it has, which provides um, difficulty. Obviously, and now uh, our standard of living and how much energy we use, because if you increase the amount of people and you have a set limit of how much you're allowed to emit, and then they want to reduce the amount of, of energy available mm -hmm. at the same time as saying they want to increase agricultural production, but you can't use as much fertilizer and you have to reduce pesticide use and you can't use all of these other things. And so... It's it's like these contradictions of what their ideals are, what they what they want to achieve, and then what is the actual practical realities behind it all. And I think you've you've really um, demonstrated how in in this in the case of Quebec, there's uh, there's real issues there, given how strong that you are in your hydroelectricity, but there's these other realities that are that are coming in and. You were able to, to <laughs> articulate that so well. Well, and, um, and, and to your point, I, I, I think Ontario will have the same question to ask itself, you know, whether it's with hydro, nuclear, or other source of power. And, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of population growth. I think I, I think it's a way for, you know, Canada is Canada is big and wide and very underpopulated compared to other countries of the world. But you need to understand that when you bring more people in, there's three things that you automatically need to increase. You need to increase the real estate because people need to live somewhere. You need to increase the energy because people are going to, you know, especially in a winter country like Canada, uh, you need to you need to increase that. And you also need to make sure that you can increase the number the number the number of jobs or or business opportunities that can be supplied by 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 the country for these people to be able to thrive and to positively contribute. I think Canada is excellent in terms of jobs. Real estate definitely could be some improvement in in terms of in terms of construction, especially in some cities. But in terms of energy, this is something that could really really slow Canada growth uh, if if we continue to have these fights between an energy an energetic sector and another one, and uh, you know difficulties in, in, in producing energy uh, across the country. So I think it's a pro it's, it's a situation in Quebec that that is becoming a problem, could become a crisis, but, but other provinces are definitely not immune. Absolutely. And, and I think this is an issue that's going to be affecting all the provinces in Canada, not, not just Quebec. We're all, we're all in it together, it would seem. Um, yes. So I, I wanted to ask, has there been much of a conversation between the government of Quebec um, and the public about the future of energy in the province? Or is this something that's just kind of on the periphery of, of people? It is a little bit politically on the periphery, especially of the Quebec-Canada relations, but 
as you know, it is very much at the forefront of Alberta and Saskatchewan discussions with the government of Canada, the central government, uh, arguably also for Newfoundland for, for different reasons. But it's another very good example that Quebec thought that it could escape or evade this debate. Uh, and, 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 and the central government, the federal government was also very happy to say, OK, Quebec, you can do your thing. But now, with the potential shortages and, the, and, and some problems that, that this could create, well, there, there needs to be a new discussion at, at all level about energy supply. And, and, and I think that's a good point that this, you know, it, it was a little bit under rug swept, but I don't think it can remain for a long time, especially, especially with political pressure from out west. And uh, Quebec wanting to be assertive and wanting to develop its economy and wanting to bring more people in, uh, I, I think I think the federal government is not going to be able to 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 swing that over and 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 be quiet about it. They, they will they, Quebec will need to be part of the energy national conversation, whether whether the federal government would that, would like it or not. Well, for sure, especially. <laughs> especially with respect to the the exporting of energy and if other provinces like Ontario or New Brunswick wants to um, use some of that exported energy from Quebec, but yet Quebec runs mm -hmm. into trouble, maybe they'll stop the exports. I, like, what's your take on that? Would you think that, I guess, w given these contracts, if, is there a force majeure in there that if Quebecers are in trouble, you, they will stop the export? Well, the, the interesting question, because Quebec has always favored exports toward the U.S. rather than towards Ontario or Atlantic provinces. Uh, you know, with Ontario, there's not there's not even a lot of interconnections that are built that you can transport the power and, you know, and distribute it from a province to the other. Quebec has always favored the U.S. because they've always seen it as a much larger consumer. And uh, the U.S. And, and especially some states in the U.S. were more inclined to sign long-term deals with Quebec, uh, especially because separation was a threat in the mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, and 90s. So some Canadian provinces were a little bit more, you know, wary about, you know, signing long-term de long-term en energy deals with Quebec. Uh, I I think that you will need to have some reorganization in terms of transportation and distribution, and. Quebec and the, and the premier has said it many times. They would be interested in exporting to other Canadian provinces, mostly Ontario. So uh, we'll see what happens because that would put even more pressure on the grid. But it is definitely something that that Quebec would seriously consider. Uh, but as far as the current deals that they have with the U.S., they are very heavy. You know, multi-year carrying contract. You know, you cannot really renege on them because that's going to cost you a fortune. Uh, so so <laughs> Quebec is a little bit stuck with those deals. But at the same time, they make money out of it. So I don't think they would like to renege and get out of them. Uh, but, you know, in five five or six years when there's even more pressure pressure on the local grid, maybe this is a discussion that people say, why should my electricity prices increase while you give discounts to Americans? Right. I mean, that's political dynamite, isn't it? Yeah, it's it. It, it, it. it certainly makes for a more complicated conversation than the one we are having right now. <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah. So if I could just go back a second to when you talked about the possibility, remote as it may be, for the, the Minister of Energy to grant pilot projects for, say, um, natural gas development. So let's say for hypothetically, let's say they give pr approval for such a pilot project and natural gas is produced. Do you think that would be used for domestic consumption or could it be um, exported? Well, mainly if you look, especially from my understanding at the, the first years of, of production, that would be mainly for the local market. Okay, so, so namely put into the, the natural gas distributor grid to be mainly for Quebec customers. Uh, you you will need to get to more significant volumes. Not to say it's impossible. It definitely can be done if you if you look at the discovery that there's in the lowland that you could get to a point where you could export. Definitely feasible, but that's going to take a little bit more time. And in terms of offsetting costs and benefits for Quebec, I think if the province was to allow for natural gas production they would 
they would probably do it with an angle that Quebec needs part of this energy and that it wouldn't be only for export. I I don't think that they would give the green light unless there was part for uh, local uh, consumption. And, uh, and and with the ban that's currently in place in Quebec, it is still something that is, you know, not obvious to achieve, as mainly in the short and medium term. Right. Um, so what was the public reaction uh, in Quebec when the German chancellor came asking Canada for natural gas? What was the what was the Quebec reaction? Did they care or did it resonate at all with anybody? Well, two kinds of reactions. So, so the first reaction is, well, of course, we understand that Germany has needs. And if they don't do it, they will need to restart most of their 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 coal plants. OK, which is also something that Chancellor Scholz said. Uh, yeah. But. I wouldn't say there was a reaction that, oh, as Quebecers, of course we could supply it. Of course, companies that have claims and, and people that you know know the field in Quebec uh, said that this is something that could be done. But but the main reaction was to be, well, there might be some natural gas out west that could be exported. And one thing that's made the, 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 the debate a little bit more complicated for whether it's for Quebec or even Canadian gas is that Joe Biden's administration has given the green light to quite a few projects of liquid natural gas exports from the East Coast, uh, which which in the U.S. has mostly always been, especially in the Boston region, an, an undersupplied uh, region for for natural gas. Now they now they're going to build the pipelines and they're going to have the export terminals to be able to export to the, to to Europe. So I would say that if Quebec and the rest of Canada wants to do it, they better not wait too long because uh, the United States are going to do it, while Canada is mainly build those infrastructure out of the West Coast to be able to serve the Asian market, with, which also makes sense. Uh, I think there's going to be a race between different exporters. Uh, and of course, you know, you need to take into account that Qatar and, and other uh, petrol monarchies in the Middle East also have an interest in supplying this gas. So, so yes, it could be possible from Quebec. Yes, it could be possible from Canada. But people need to hurry fast because other suppliers are also going to be able to do it. And, and the situation with Russia and Ukraine might not last forever either. So, so who, who knows in two years if Russia is not, you know, back supplying a lot of the, uh, I would say, middle, middle European market. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, um, I've been reading various articles from people in the European Union who are saying that that's it. They'll never buy from Russia again. It's over. And, and I think, well, it's over until you, you get short or it's just, you know, the infrastructure is already there. Why wouldn't you use it? And I, I keep thinking what happens when there is a peace agreement because, you know, peace will happen eventually. Um, are they just going to shun Russia altogether or, you know, how, do, how does that work? And um, you're right. It's uh, who knows what will happen two years from now, five years from now. And um but as you so um, clearly point out in in the piece that that you that you ran saying could Quebec run out of energy, there's mm -hmm. these different um, there's these different options that that need to be considered, and which brings me back again to um, is that level of discussion about these various options facing Hydro Quebec it, is that happening in the Quebec public? Or is it mainly am amongst political pundits um, thinking about that future? Or are the people involved at all? The debate is now very much into the public because, uh, you know, before you, you used to have the, minist the, the Ministry of Energy was tied with natural resource. Since, since October of last year, it's been tied with the, with the Ministry of Economy now. So, and, and you have a minister that is way more assertive with, with, with good reasons. Uh, and, you know, put things into the debate, like there might be increase in prices. There might be difference in supplies. We want to do this with the U.S. You know, we need to cut our consumption. So it's more in the public debate now because there's been some proposals that would affect the price that people pay and the volume that they're able to use. So, so I would say people are, are waking up to the situation and they're not slowly waking up now. You know, you used to have some 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 media pieces about energy and energy debate. You used to have it, I don't know, maybe once a month. Now it's every other day you have something in the media about it. So people wow. are not only discussing it, people are interested. And they're interested because 
they and their position is with all that we did, with all the confidence we gave in hydroelectricity, and with all that we give, no way we're going to pay more, no way we're going to ration what we use, no no way we're going to accept brownouts or curtailments or whatever you want to call them. So people are waking up to this. I think it's going to take a few months, if not a few years, for for the debate to reach a certain maturity where enough people understand the issue so we can really move forward with uh, with, so, with with solutions that are, I would say, more grassroots solutions and, and solutions that, that people want. But, but people vote with their wallet too. And they go to the gas pump and they buy the natural gas and they use the hydro when they want to use because, you know, this they put, they put the money where they really want to do it. And, and I think in the end, in the end, market solutions are the solutions that are going to be chosen by people. And, uh, you know, government can do things to a certain extent. But in terms of hydro prices, they, they're going to have to pay a political price if they if they move to to uh, to raise them too much. OK, so that brings me to two questions. So. Uh, the first of all is with respect to electric vehicles. There's this push that the internal combustion engine will be banned. No new ones will be allowed to be bought in Canada after 2035. Mm -hmm. What is the uptake in electric vehicles in Quebec outside of Montreal? Is it is it high? Do, do Quebecers want to it purchase is. an electric vehicle? Yeah, so so it is it is not insignificant but it is small, especially as you move outside of Montreal, Quebec City, Gatineau, or places where people would use their electric cars only to commute. Uh, the, the the other problem with electric cars is that uh, they are first-generation vehicles, and now people start to see the price that they cost to uh, you know repair and maintain, which is a problem with these people buying another electric vehicle again. And this is where this is where you want to make sure that Quebec electricity prices remain low because the number one reason people buy electric cars in Quebec is because they're going to save on gas and it's going to make them cheaper over the long run to drive. It's not really, you know, ecological or environmental consideration. It's, it's again, market solutions, pocketbook issues. You give me a discount to buy the car. I don't have to pay gas. Electricity is cheap. You know, if I drive... <laughs> If, if I drive 100,000 kilometers, then it makes sense. So, so people do it. So again, in terms of, you know, if you want people to buy more electric vehicle, you got to make sure that your grid is fully supplied. But the more people buy electric vehicle, the more they use electricity, the more electricity becomes expensive. So <laughs> what's so, so what's this? And, and also the other thing is in terms of the discounts and the rebates that you give people when they buy electric cars. Uh, now with the trade deals with the United States, it's going to be it's going to become more difficult to do that uh, under the uh, under the uh, not the NAFTA but the USMCA agreement. Right. So it, it, it is something I, I know that is very very a very high consideration for automakers in Ontario, uh, but also from a from a car dealership perspective here in Quebec. So so just to your point, you know, if tomorrow Quebec would have twenty percent more electric vehicles. The, the the price of electricity would be going up because you you, you need to take this power somewhere. Right, I increased demand means you need to have increased supply, which you need costs to have money. increased price or <laughs> or increase in price. Right, this is right. You know, you know, for you and I, this is very very basic. You know, micro and macro economics. Right, it's there's just no way out of that unless the government subsidizes it. And that subsidy comes from taxpayers, right? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. which which in turn pits some people against others. So, and also the, to maybe a last point on on, on cars and vehicles. Uh, Quebec is the province, the country where you have the highest increase year after year for ten years. You know, buying SUVs and pickups rather than individuals and smaller cars, and mm -hmm. this trend is not reversing. So people maybe they go electric or hybrid, but they buy bigger cars, which require even more petrol to 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 be on the on the roads. So. <laughs> I mean, I don't know where it ends, but outside of Quebec City and Montreal, sometimes sometimes you can see 10, 20, 30 cars without seeing anything else than a pickup or SUV. Not different, not not different than the basic American suburb in that regard. Or or Western Canada for that. Or Western matter. Canada or, or Western Canada for the last for the last, I don't know, three hundred years, I guess. <laughs> as long as there's been SUVs and, and trucks for sure. Yeah, um yeah. so the the second question I want to ask, and perhaps we can end on this one because I know mm -hmm. we're coming up to almost an hour here. 
um, is that you mention solutions and that there needs to be more grassroots solutions to mm -hmm. these problems. What do you recommend? What What's your recommended solutions for this? What What should be done? I think I think there's not a single solution. Like, like I, I think it's a combination. And this is something that I, I try to reflect in the article that, yes, you need more solar. Yes, you need more wind. And you need more energy production in general in Quebec. Okay, for sure. And, and there's a place for new elect hydroelectricity dams that are going to take 8 to 15 years. But in the meantime, while you get this power up to the level that you need and require, okay, if it is something that you could ever do, you will need to be part of a transition. And the transition can not only be let's let's stop using a certain kind of fuel or, or power and transition everything with, with hydroelectricity because it is mathematically impossible to do so in Quebec. So the transition needs to also imply other sources of energy, whether it is natural gas, whether it is having a little bit more of a refining power, and finding a way to finding a way to tr to transition towards having a higher percentage of electricity and renewables in the energy mix, but at the same time making sure that this is an energy mix that you're not so dependent on a single source of power. And honestly, the same piece of advice can be, I think, could be given to Saskatchewan and especially Alberta. Oil and gas is great. You guys manage to do very well on those and, and coal in certain circumstances. But please make sure that you don't rely too heavily on that because if it ever goes back to ten or twelve dollars a barrel and it stays there for uh, for five years instead of three months like it did during COVID. That's not going to work well for your economy either. And that's not going to work well for your supply either. So I think the situation in Russia and Ukraine are, are exposing the countries or the localities that are very dependent on a single source, whether it's a single country or a single source of energy. And you see those that are thriving a little bit more are those that are able to have a, a good energy mix. And in that regard, there's no reason Canada doesn't do as well, if not better than the United States. That's so true, and and I'm glad that 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 we'll end on the diversification of of energy note because mm -hmm. that is really important, especially when you have um, grids that have become more and more vulnerable for a number of different reasons. And in Europe, mm -hmm. it's definitely because of over reliance on um, a single source of of reliable well energy that that is reliable when used, um, and. Like, for example, Saskatchewan has an interesting mix of natural gas production, coal production, a little bit of hydro, um, and now some some wind and solar. But um, it's the, the, the mix, the potential for the mix is there, and now they want to invest in small modular reactors, and they have mm -hmm. a lot of lithium and, and helium and hydrogen and so on. Um, but... You're right. Don't put all your eggs in one basket because if something goes down, then it becomes extremely difficult to extricate oneself from from those problems. Yeah, um, no, exactly, and I I, I think that's a that's a right note to 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 conclude on. Not put all your eggs in the same basket, and if you have a little bit more eggs in one of the basket, make sure that you watch this one closely. <laughs> that's a good one. Well, thank you so much, David, for taking your time out in in the day to to have a chat with me about this issue. And, and I my hope pleasure, that, my pleasure. Yeah, th thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much.